Hey, Deserve listeners, a lot of you have been asking me to react to some more of the Colleen Ballinger videos. So let's watch this video. This video is by Film Cooper on YouTube. And my name is Dr. Kirk Hahn. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's see what Film Cooper has to say about Colleen Ballinger. This is the first like big one that kind of broke everything, but it gets worse. She asks him, a 15 year old at the time, Adam, you need questions for your Q and A? And then without him responding, I guess, just says, are you a virgin? And she's in her thirties and he's 15. Wow, yeah, there's really no explanation for that. That would justify that. I just, you know, there's some things where you see a screen cap where you're like, well, you know, we need to, we need the full picture, but there's just no possible justification for asking that question. I mean, <laughs> what? Yeah. Wow. Insane. I'm over a decade younger than her. I can't even imagine thinking that's okay to say. And she has kids. That's also the thing. Has kids. Can she not understand that it would be weird if somebody that her kids idolized had a group chat asking them if they were a virgin? She can't think about, is that weird? And then there's this screenshot from a separate- And I will say that perpetrators who have a track record of predating on children will groom in a variety of ways. And one of the ways in which they will groom is to slowly, inter and by the way, trigger warning, actually, if you have been harmed in this way, you might want to skip, you probably don't want to watch any of this stuff, honestly. But what some predators will do is they will introduce sexual content in a, almost like a slippery slope way, you know, progressively getting more and more down the road, if you will. They want to go from A to Z, but they know they can't. So they have to go slow, but they don't want to go too slow. <laughs> they, they want to go fast. They want to go as fast as they possibly can get away with. And so, they'll sometimes throw stuff out there. And if the child or the system reacts negatively against it, then they go, oh, okay, I went too far and I have to back away and I have to take my time. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll take the longer road with that issue. But if the question is received without any noticeable pushback or consequence to the predator, then they're like, oh, okay, good. So now I know I can go even further. And predators will do this, not only sexual predators, but predators in general. Like the famous example that I always think of is Charlie Manson. You know, before he was what he became later, he was an aspiring musician and he somehow uh, managed to get to a party with the Beach Boys in the LA area. And he was desperate to get to know the Beach Boys because, you know, they were huge, one of the biggest bands in the world at the time. So he's at this party and he, he walks up to one of the guys in the Beach Boys. And the way that Charlie Manson talked, this guy in the Beach Boys, he was turned off by by Charlie Manson and would later recall that he thought that Charlie Manson was a dangerous individual. So we don't know exactly what happened there, but the way that Charlie Manson might try to recruit people, and because he had already acquired a following, the way that these people will get you is they will test the waters and they'll find someone who isn't repulsed by them because they either know consciously or subconsciously that if the person isn't repulsed, then there must be something about the personality. Maybe they were abused before themselves such that they're used to being overpowered. They're used to fawning to abusers. And so one, and they know that those individuals are much easier to manipulate, right? So Charlie Manson goes up to one Beach Boy and that Beach Boy is like, what in the world? And walks away. And then Charlie Manson goes to the drummer in the Beach Boys and the drummer completely fell for it. And we don't know exactly what happened, but before long, the drummer was under the spell of Charlie Manson. And that relationship grew. Eventually, the Beach Boys actually recorded a Charlie Manson song. If you, it's a little known fact. <laughs> the Beach Boys recorded a Charlie Manson composition. So my point is, is that perpetrators, not only of sexual violence, but of a lot of different coercion and control will, especially if they have a pattern, they will learn, again, consciously or subconsciously, but it often is conscious, that one way to find victims so that they can enact their perpetration is to test the waters. And if someone responds in a way that is not in line with the vision that they have with a victim, someone that's easily victimized, then they'll just move on to someone else and they just start going around the room before they find someone that is e more easily victimized, which of course alerts us to how important it is to help every 
everyone who has been abused in the past such that they're not susceptible to this kind of control in the future. Be talking to minors. Anyways, back to the screenshot. One kid says, at Taco Bell. Another kid says, I'm about to eat 90 brownies. Colleen says, tell me what move I should make on ball cocker cock blocker stock dick. Oh, okay. So why would you say that? I can't even ah, be like, and then minor saying, suck his dick. That is, wow. Yeah, wow. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So bad. She created that situation for a minor to say that. We think, we assume it's a minor because her videos and, you know, people who were in those group chats coming out and saying, yeah, I was 12. And there's also screenshots that we'll get into later where you can obviously see that she knows that these are kids. She says, is inviting a sexual conversation with minors. Why would you do that? And then she says, okay. I'm gonna go to him and say, hi Patrice, I'm ready to stress eat your wiener, so show me your ball cocker. Thanks for the advice. Yes, an amazing plan. You're welcome. My God, my God. So we don't know the truthfulness of these screenshots, but given everything that we've seen, it is very unlikely that these sorts of things weren't happening. If this isn't accurate, there's a lot of other allegations that are all pointing, that there's, there's too many people coming forward, right? So we have good reason to believe that this is accurate. And my God, the, the first time I watched Colleen Ballinger six months ago or five months ago, the reporting, I don't think it had come across this stuff before. Yeah, I would watch the different news outlets report on this. And there were some, there were some allegations that were commonly discussed, but this kind of thing, I don't remember this being out there. Maybe it was always out there, I don't know. But yeah, wow. So weird. What's your favorite position? OP, I don't know what that means. Lord Jesus. Who is your least favorite YouTuber? Hey, if it's helping you, then embrace it. What we're seeing here is a, you know, side conversation, a conversation that has nothing to do with anything that Colleen's talking about. And then her coming in and go, hey kids, what's your favorite sex position? What's your favorite way to fuck? Yeah, I do remember this allegation and I do remember it being alarming. So yeah, I do remember this one. And the kids in the group chat ignore her because they don't want to talk about it because that's weird. I think it's safe to say that she has just poor taste in what's okay to say because look at this tweet. Oh my God, the public restroom and smells like hashtag gagging. You could have said that it smells gross or you could have just shut the fuck up. That's also possible. All right, cookies, go follow Harvey Julian. He's hilarious and you should all R word him with love. Okay. Hey fools, sorry I've been MIA. Moving is killing me right now. I'll be R wording your Twitter feeds again very soon. Yeah, <laughs> just my God. Now, I, I'll, I will add that there, this is no excuse for this, but I will add to the context that there are online spaces where children, teenagers, maybe younger, are using these kinds of words in very flippant ways because they're children and they don't know <laughs> or they are working some stuff out. I don't know. But if you actually are privileged enough to, because, you know, as a therapist, they would let me into these worlds and I would see the kinds of stuff that these kids are talking about. And it's, it, it's, um, it's eye opening. Not all kids, of course, but many. I think it's a product of a lot of things. One, because they're kids. Two, because they are trying to be funny and they have very specific I don't know what to say. They they have a there, there's a when you get a online group or a friend group, there's a a development of an inside jokery that can lead to outside viewers coming in late in the game and seeing something that looks really quite bizarre. When, when I think about my childhood friends in high school, we had our own language. <laughs> we, we we were so enmeshed with each other that we could have full conversations that no one else could understand. And, you know, that's not unusual, but I think that it's, it's just one of the phenomena that can happen. And, and so online, there, there's millions of young people who are interacting this way. And again, not all the kids, and there's various different da-da-da. But I, I have seen kids inter, you know, talk this way. This is no excuse for Colleen Ballinger, of course. But I wonder if she actually was being rewarded for this sort of thing. Maybe she was even attracted to this material because of that. I don't know. But I could imagine that if we saw all the different interacting, 
that these kinds of tweets or these kinds of DMs were appreciated greatly by some of the individuals. It was almost like speaking their language, you know. Again, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just wondering if that's also part of the context. No, it's no excuse. Any adult should, especially a content provider, should understand, hey, I could get in trouble for this. I mean, at the very least, you would imagine that some, and that does raise that question that at no point did she think, maybe this isn't a good idea. I should refrain from that kind of material. She seemed to just keep doing it. Maybe it escalated. I don't know. So you would just think that someone, some sort of editor would kick in. (laughs) Wow. Today's video is sponsored by Ada. So I got COVID recently. It was probably the sickest I've ever been in my entire life. It was the worst. Well, did you know there are treatments you can take for COVID-19? And that means that there's something you can do if you get COVID, things you can do to avoid getting really sick. And that's where Ada comes in. You take their free questionnaire online. I've taken it, it's confidential. And you find out if you or a loved one may be eligible for treatment. If eligible, you can talk to a clinician via telehealth within two hours. And if prescribed, you can pick up your treatment from a local pharmacy. So click the link below to find out if you are eligible and learn more about treatment options. Smiley face. All right, all right. Not what I would have said. Kind of triggering because of you know, thank you for keeping me up all night, scary cop in my dream that kept R-wording me. I hope we never meet again. Don't share that. You can keep that offline. Kind of weird thing to just pop out as a little joke. Josh and I were sweetly talking of our love for each other, and then the rancid smell of my silent fart R-worded us. I think I ruined the moment. You don't think we can move on from this little chunk? I think it just is clear. Yeah, I talked about this, I think, in the first video about Colleen Ballinger, that we live in a world now in which the main entertainers for children are self-employed individuals. In my day and, you know, in the not too distant past, you had shows like Sesame Street and uh, uh, Mr. Rogers and these kinds of things. Um, You had uh, Reading Rainbow. These are corporations that are being observed and there's a lot of handlers. You know, it's not just Mr. Rogers walking out on stage and saying whatever he wants to. You have the FCC, you know, you have government regulation. You have laws, you have a legal team and directors and editors and uh, writers. And and also, if Mr. Rogers were to do something horrible, which of course is ridiculous, but if he had, the the whole system would be taken down. The, The whole show and all those employees would also, they would all lose their jobs. So there's a lot of people collectively interested in making sure that the content stays safe. Whereas today, you have individuals like Colleen Ballinger who just wake up in the morning and turn on their webcam and they just start making content. They become huge overnight and it's just themselves. They have, you know, by at some point they probably have employees and a legal team, but they're the CEO, they're the talent, they're the writer, they're, they're direct, they're the director. They make all the choices. There's no one in power over them to rein them in at all. And so they're just you know, doing whatever they do. And they have to make content. If you're a smart content provider, you got to make content constantly. And so throughout the day, they're having different moods. And and so they might be intoxicated at times. And, and it, it's, a, it's a different world. And for parents, it's terrifying because my parents could set me in front of the TV, in front of, you know, Mr. Rogers and trust that things would probably be okay. The typical child content on the internet, on YouTube, you have no idea. There are so many horror stories of uh, manipulative practices. You know, there'll be some channel from another country that will uh, suck children in and then like uh, the parents watch the first few minutes and it looks fine. And then halfway through the video, it transitions to this very dark manipulative content to try to manipulate the children's the children to do things. I've heard reports. I, I, I don't know if this is accurate, but, but of course, you know, those kinds of things are going to exist. If people can make money, then they're going to do what they do, especially if they're allowed to do it and there's no regulation around it. So, yeah, wow. And so to think that Colleen Bounder was just running wild for years and years, she was making content for years and years, like a decade longer, I don't know. And DMing with children for years and years and years, just no regulation, no oversight. You know, the children aren't necessarily open to their parents about DMing with Colleen Ballinger, right? Even if, especially if they're joking about sex stuff, they're like, oh, I better not show my parents. It just, and then it's kind of out in the open because she's recording these things and no consequences were happening. 
and you could argue they're still not really happening. It's, um, yeah, Th this past year, I have really become more and more aware of the, not just this problem, but the broader problem with children being exploited in a variety of ways on social media, particularly on YouTube, because that's where I live with the family vloggers. You know, I've done all those episodes and the ethics around this and the exploitation, the the lack of any sort of legal protection for children, meaning that there are uh, there, there's one law, I think, in Illinois, and I've been over it, and it is it was just introduced and just passed, and it looks good on the out from the outside, but when you actually look into it, it's completely worthless. So essentially, in the United States, and particularly around the world, there are no laws protecting children from being exploited by their parents for profit on YouTube. A parent can, uh, you know, as long as the parent is staying below the threshold of abuse, like hitting their child, that kind of thing. But even then, some stuff. Anyway, point is, is that a parent can pressure a child from you know, the, the minute they wake up until the minute they go to sleep to make content and the parent gets to keep all the money and there's no consequence to the parents for harming the children this way. We all understand that that's not healthy. <laughs> that, you know, one or two videos every now and then, okay, as long as it's integrated in a well-balanced meal, if you will, of a, of a, of a childhood they get to play in the way that they want to play. They're not constantly being filmed. They're, of course, not constantly worried about feedback and how they look and what their body looks like and did they say the right thing and how are the views going. You know, it, it, it's, it's, of course, way, way too much pressure. And I hope that laws will be passed eventually to protect children, at least in my state of Washington, such that these things stop happening. But that will not negate the harm that is currently happening and has already happened. And I don't foresee this happening. I don't know, I, 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 I just can't imagine it never happening, but I don't see any movement in that direction. <sighs> it, when I first became, a th when I decided to become a therapist, I, a part of my mission or reason for becoming a therapist was I actually wanted to make the world a better place and I wanted to protect children. I wanted to do what I could so that innocent people could be saved or could be helped. And, uh, and of course, and most therapists, particularly family therapists like myself, have that mission. And I reckoned with a, a very dark time professionally about two years into me being a therapist when I was an intern and maybe an early post-grad therapist that no matter what I did, no matter how hard I worked, abuse was still going to be happening. Even if I managed to end the abuse for the people that I had contact with, my own clients or whatever, that did not negate all the other abuse. Because, of course, we all know that, right? We all know intellectually that right now children are being abused. If, if you just draw a mile radius in a circle around your wherever you are right now, as, as long as you're not in the middle of nowhere, but even then, the, if you, if you, within a mile of where you are at right now, there's a high likelihood that there are multiple children being abused in a variety of ways right this second. We all kind of intellectually understand that, I would think, or at least you intellectually understand that children are being abused, and we haven't ended we haven't ended ch child abuse. But I think there's a distance to that. It, it feels like, well, it's intellectual. It's just it's happening, sure, but it's not really happening, right? Well, when you become a therapist and you actually work with these folks and you have colleagues that work with these folks, and you look at the research, and you're in it all the time, uh, uh, and other professionals, professionals will have a similar experience who also work with these, these individuals, like a, a law enforcement officer who specializes in this. When you actually have contact with it, you really feel it. You, you feel like, oh my God, this is happening all the time, and has been happening all the time, and it will always be happening, and it's happening right this second. And frankly, a lot of the clients I had contact with who I was actually trying to help, I did everything I could and it still didn't end the abuse that was happening to them, even though the government was involved and the legal system was involved and Child Protective Services was involved, DSH, DSHS, other professionals, doctors, the abuse still happened. I could tell you details about it, but it is distressing. So on one hand, intellectually, I think it's not hard to understand that, but when you really feel it, 
it is, it, it, it is, I don't even know what the word, it's demoralizing, it's depressing, it's terrifying, it rips your heart out, it's, it's, um, it just makes you wonder, like, what are we all doing with ourselves? Why is anything a thing when that is happening? Why, why do we care about the new Marvel movie when those things are happening? You know, just at the top of my head, it's like, why is anything being talked about other than that? And I don't really answer that question. And throughout my career, I have just solidified that notion to me over and over and over again, such that that notion is with me all the time. And it doesn't, it doesn't ruin my life the way that it did originally. But it's still depressing and demoralizing and, and awful. And it's happening right now in the world, in homes, in schools, in doctor's offices, on gymnastics teams, and it's also happening right in front of us on YouTube and DMs and, and this kind of thing. It, it's, it's happening here too. And there, there's so much more we could be doing. The legislatures of the United States and in other countries could pass laws that could start to regulate this, could start to punish people for this, could uh, allocate funds, tax dollars for a governing body or expand the FCC somehow, the complacency that we have around this, I think is another factor. I think another factor, because 20 years ago, Colleen Ballinger wouldn't have anyone to abuse because the vast, vast majority of parents would not allow their children on the internet without supervision and would w take one look at Colleen Ballinger and say, no, 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 watch Mr. Rogers. <laughs> watch a show that I can try. I don't know who that person is. So... Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you feel the weight, we can all feel the weight. And if you've been harmed in this way or anything close to this, then I apologize on behalf of our society for doing nothing to prevent it. <laughs> Creep. Hope this video doesn't start any shit. Anyways, weirdos, I love you all. Please subscribe. All right, interesting video by Film Cooper. And let's adjourn there. <laughs> Until next time. Everyone, please take care of yourself and take care of others, particularly children, because we and they all deserve it. We and they really, really do.